Hello, listeners. This is the fireside chat. <laughs> um, how many people have heard uh, the podcast interview I did with uh, Beckstead um, a couple months ago? OK, pretty decent number. Yeah, I'm going to try not to not repeat that, uh, push on from some of the topics that we raised there. Cool. So the first uh, question I had was, uh, back in 2012, like since 2012, there's been a distinct movement, I think, towards focusing on existential risk and long-term future causes. Yeah. But it's not as if there's been a lot of arguments that we had well, we weren't aware of in 2012. Uh, in a sense, uh, we've just become more confident uh, that or we're more willing to make this kind of contrarian bet that thinking about the very long-term future is uh, the most impactful thing to do. And I'm curious to know whether you think uh, we should have uh, made that switch earlier, whether we were too averse to doing something that was weird and unconventional that other like, people in general society might not have respected or understood. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I would, uh, I guess I would say partly that um, some of the, I think some things have changed that have made it more attractive, but I mostly think we should have, we should have like gone, uh, gone in more boldly on those issues sooner and had a, had a sufficient case to do so. Um, I think like the main thing that, that I think the main things that have that have changed is uh, with with AI in particular, the sense of progress in the field has taken off and it's become a bit more tangible for that reason. Um, but uh, but mostly I agree that like we could have gone in earlier and um, and I regret that. I think like uh, you know the the things that we spending money to grow uh, work in that field sooner I think could have been would, would have been better spent than like what the effective altruist community is likely to spend its like its last dollars on and uh, I w I wish the field was larger today and uh, yeah so that I think I think that was a mistake and I guess if you try to ask like why did we make that mistake. Um, I think I think I think you're probably pointing in roughly the right direction. Like there's, it's uncomfortable to do something super weird, and um, you know I think there was, and I don't know. I guess different people would have different answers. I think that, that I think I probably if I introspect on myself and I say why didn't I come into this like more boldly earlier, and I I, I include myself in the group of people who could have. Um, I think it you know there was a sense of like. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Do I, am I ready for that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are people going to think? Uh, yeah, there were. Um, well, people came up with all these stories for why uh, working on reducing poverty or uh, helping animals in the, the standard ways that we'd been doing before were also the best ways to help the long-term future, which which struck me as very suspicious arguments at the time because they were just they seemed like rationalizations for just not changing anything based on what could be like a really crucial consideration. Um, I mean, do you think that there's anything that we might be doing like that today? I mean, do, do you think that they were actually rationalizations, or were they like good considerations that we had to work through? I mean, I think it's true that um, like a lot of ways we could do good now, including like addressing global poverty. I think you could make a case that it has a positive effect on the long-term future. And if I was going to guess the sign, that's the sign I would guess. Um, I uh, I don't think that like. I don't think that like donating to um, you know the usual suspects AMF and such would be like uh, my leading guess for how you're going to like change the long-term character of the future in the best way possible. Um, so you know, yeah. So I don't know. I don't want to like I don't want to like psychologize other people's like reasons for coming up with that view. Um, yeah, I would I would be like guessing elsewhere. Um, for that, and I don't know, could we be making other mistakes like that today? Um, I don't see one. I think like there's ones you you could say maybe we're doing that for, um, mm -hmm. like maybe you could make a case like, oh, are we doing that with like infinite ethics or something? That's not much of a debate about that. But, like, um, seems like it could be, uh, yeah, another crucial consideration that could really sw switch things around. It could be. I mean, according to me, I, I would say I would say like if I was opt doing the thing that was best for infinite ethics, it would look a lot like, you know, the stuff I'm doing for global catastrophic risks. But isn't that really suspicious? Well, I, okay. yeah, why is that? <laughs> I don't find it that suspicious. Like, um, you know, uh, like one reason to think about that is like I, I think that a lot of the stuff on like. AI and biosecurity preparations, like when I run the numbers, um, I think the like expected cost per life saved is like right up there with like the best ways of just like helping humans. I think mm -hmm. these are like big deal things in the world and they're not just big deals if you have like an astronomical waste, you know, worldview. 
Um, and so, you know, so I think, I think they weather a storm from just like help the most humans to do the best thing for astronomical waste. So like it wouldn't be that weird if they were also hmm. do the best thing for like, uh, you know, infinite good outcomes. Um, I think that's less tight there, but I mean, I, if I was going to explain the argument a little bit more, I would say like, well, okay, if there's a way of like achieving infinite good, um, then either it's a scalable process where you want more of it, or it's a process where you just like want to get it once. If it's a scalable process where you want more of it, then it's going to be some physical process that could be discoverable by like a completed science. And then that's kind of like the same astronomical waste argument applies to that because that's where all the possible resources are is in the distant future and we'll probably unlock that if we kind of like nail that problem. Yeah. Um, and conversely, if it's a thing where you know you just get it once, um, I don't have any I don't have any good candidates available right now uh, for like how we're going to like you know achieve infinite value through some esoteric means. And my my bet would be on like you know a more developed civilization with a completed science finding it. So I like, yeah. want to make sure we get there. We could at least tell people about it a bit more. We could. If it, if it seemed that decisive, yeah. We could. We'd have some infinite ethics promotion advocacy group. <laughs> that would be pushing the boundaries, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe bad for the rest of the movement. Um, so uh, the, like, over, over that amount of time as well, there's been a movement uh, among uh, mainstream AI researchers to take alignment issues seriously. But yeah. they seem to have been fairly, fairly slow to get on board. Um, and even now, it seems like we're making decent progress on concrete uh, technical questions. But it's not as if uh, people are stampeding into, into joining this effort, uh, people who've been doing other mainstream capabilities research before. Yeah. Um, why do you think that is? And uh, are there things that we could have done differently or could do differently now? Yeah, why is the, why is the AI community um, not doing all the things it could do on taking technical safety seriously as a problem? Um, yeah, I think it's a. I think that's a difficult question. I think partly it's a matter of time, and it's a, a matter of like, uh, of timelines and what people believe, how far away they believe powerful AI systems are. Um, so, um, that, I think that's a big chunk of it. I also think a big chunk of it is that um, some of the work um, involves motivations that are kind of unusual. And are unusual for thinking about, like with like the sort of like lens you would have as like a machine learning researcher. Like I think, um, for example, um, you know, I think Paul Cristiano does a lot of really excellent work on AI alignment as a problem, and he blogs about it. And a lot of his blog posts are not really shaped like machine learning papers. Mm -hmm. um, I think like fields tend to get organized around successful methodologies and people who have employed those methodologies successfully. Mm -hmm. Um, and like sets of problems that are interesting, um, and they and I think like I think that like you know machine learning is like a field that is that like likes empirical results and you know explaining them what you did with some code and what the empirical results were, and I think a lot of the issues that that like come into play when you're trying to think well about um, AI safety AI alignment. Um, I think there are some things that like fit that, and people do them, and it's great. Um, I think there are a lot of things that, like, say, Paul writes about that don't fit that, and I think a lot of the things that you would have to consider to like be properly motivated to work on the problem might have a little bit of the character of not shaped like a machine learning paper, and I think that makes it hard to hard to to move things forward. Um, and I think that's a hard problem to think about. Yeah. Uh do you think that's a, a big mistake that fields are making if they're so resistant to like ideas uh, about their field that come from come from outside? Is that is that defensible because it helps them avoid nonsense that would otherwise creep in? I mean, I partly I I, I mean I might reframe uh, resistant to ideas that come from the outside. Yeah. I think um, I think you know fields are, fields are organized around like a topic, a set of problems, and some methodologies, and um, you know, new methodologies I think tend to get accepted when people come in and use a new methodology to uh, do something really impressive that by the standards of the field, solve some recalcitrant interesting problem. I'm basically expressing like a Kuhnian view about like yeah. philosophy of science. And, um, and I think there's a lot to that and it, it keeps out pseudoscience. Um, and I think it like helps keep things rigorous and there's like a valuable function to be played there. Mm. Um, 
But I think because some of the, the approaches to like thinking about the motivations behind like AI safety as a technical problem um, aren't so much shaped like a machine learning paper. Mm. I think it does set off people's like pseudoscience alarm bells, um, and I think that makes it harder um, to to like move forward in the way that I wish things would. Yeah, it seems like uh, this was an issue with concerns about nanotechnology as well, uh, maybe in the in the eighties and nineties. Uh, yes, and I guess maybe less of an issue uh, with concerns about synthetic biology. It seems like maybe maybe those concerns have come from within the field as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think, uh, I think the case of of nanotechnology is a harder one, and I feel like I feel like less sure what to think about it overall. But I do think, you know, insofar as I have looked into that, uh, like, um, say, Eric Drexler's work on nanosystems, um, I haven't I haven't seen anything that I would call like. Uh, a decisive refutation of that, and I've seen things that were called that were offered as decisive ref, decisive refutations, yeah. um, and uh, but I so I think I have like a pretty reasonable odds that like something like that is in principle possible, um, but and so I, I feel uncertain about like what to think about the field's view of that, but I, I do pay, place substantial probability on like you know that being a case of interesting work that was like on the turf of another discipline and didn't kind of like conform to the like reigning methodologies and like didn't it like maybe it's like successfully like reasoned its way to a novel conclusion but not a conclusion that was like of substantial interest to the field in the right way and like provable using like what they would normally consider the way to do science to like make it become sort of socialized and accepted um, so I, I do think you know so I, I do think it's an interesting like test bed for thinking about like the sociology of that field and mm. uh, how fields work with their intellectual norms. I mean, it's it's a little weird to talk about whether they're being irrational in this respect because like, um, in some sense, I think like these are sort of like spontaneous orders that arise and it's not like designed by one person um, and uh, they're kind of hard to change and like their fashion plays a big role in in, in fields and. Um, I think that's like clear to anybody who's like been a grad student. <laughs> um, yeah, do you think if, if we're interested in uh, changing views within uh, fields in future that we should try to pair um, launching our views with some kind of technical accomplishment, some engineering uh, result that they might respect? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, I, uh, I think it's I think it's a hard question ultimately. Like, yeah, I mean, if you took the if you if you took the strict Kuhnian view and you said, okay, well, how do you change the paradigm of a field? Yeah, you have to like come in with some revolutionary accomplishment. Mm. Um, it could that, be a long that's, delay. That's, I that's a long. That's like a tall order. Yeah. Um, I think you can do things that are like interesting by the standards of the field, um, and also are interesting for your kind of unusual motivation and like that. Is also a route to um, to like legitimizing a topic. Mm. Okay, what do you th uh, what, what career options that are very promising do you think EAs are, are neglecting to take sufficiently? Yeah, um, I mean, this isn't like I wouldn't say this is like underrated by the EA community right now, but like I, it is striking to me that we still don't have that many uh, we still we still don't have that many people from our community who are. Um, say, working on technical AI safety at OpenAI or DeepMind. Um, and we don't have that many people from our community who are working as like uh, policy advisors at those organizations. And you know, it, it seems to me that you know, if, you're, if you're trying to be prepared for a world in which like, transformative AGI might be developed over the next um, you know, 15 or 20 years, then um, you know, that, that's an unfortunate oversight. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think uh, those roles are hard to get, um, and so that's that's understandable. But I think like you know we should be making a strong effort for that. Um, I think also roles as like uh, research engineers working on AI safety are would also be pretty valuable. Um, I think, uh, and those might be those might be like um, you know not not require like going and getting a PhD in machine learning. I think that's like something that a really good software engineer. Could think about retooling for, and could successfully end up doing, and could have a could have a really big impact. You were telling me about someone who recently managed to get into OpenAI, right, uh, as a software developer, or they were a software developer. Then within a couple of months of training, they managed to get a job there as right. an engineer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like there's more room for for that kind of thing. Um, 
what else is striking to me? Um, I think it's striking. Uh, I think um, I think Jason Matheny's career is very striking to me. Um, so you know, this is somebody who's been a part of the effective altruism community, who's now the director of uh, IARPA, and has you know had I think some some pretty interesting impacts. You know, supporting uh, the Good Judgment Project and um, the you know. Uh, the competition around forecasting in in the intelligence community that I think has developed some really useful techniques that could be more widely applied in society. Um, you know, I saw I saw like the other day, uh, uh, you know, something something in the news talking about like a set of questions that like is now asked whenever uh, new projects are funded at IARPA that include you know. What will the effects be if we're working on this and another country uh, acquires this technology? How, how much? How long will it take? And what will the effects be? And can we prepare defensive countermeasures? And it was like a new set of questions that was like asked of everything that they're funding because uh, that was one of his ideas, and I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that we don't have more people, um, you know, looking for opportunities like that in in the U.S. government. Um, and I think we could. I'd, I'd be, I would love it if, if um, more people in our community um, tried to get roles as program managers at IARPA or DARPA and tried to um, you know, fund some awesome and relevant science along the way and also um, you know, develop their networks and be in a place where um, you know, they, they could play an important role if, uh, if some of the like, transformative technologies that we're interested in um, Start getting closer to uh, having a big impact on the world. What's what's the deal with Matheny? Like he was one of the first kind of proto, or he's like an EA in the early two thousands, like long before the name was uh, we came up with that. And then he's like he set on this path and has been enormously successful. Is it just a selection effect that the people who like get involved in a new set of ideas very early on tend to be extremely driven, or has he just gotten very lucky? Maybe or, or, or were we lucky to have someone so talented? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure what the answer to that is like. Yeah. Um, you could imagine that, like, you could imagine, I mean, what, a story that I'm just making up right now would be like, well, uh, there's a lot of things that I think, like, are better explained now. Um, and if you were kind of figuring everything out back then and you managed to, like, get to a lot of the crucial considerations on your own, that's kind of a stronger filter. Um, I could imagine, like, other social considerations and stuff like that, but... Um, Ultimately, I think the interesting thing is like, uh, hey, maybe we could maybe we could try some more of this strategy. Yeah. Makes <laughs> um, sense. Other ones like, I'm I'm also struck by you know I mentioned Tetlock just a moment ago. I'm struck by the fact that we don't have more people um, just going and being PhD students with Tetlock. Um, I think like uh, just like learning that methodology um, and. Uh, Deploying it somewhere else, maybe in the government, maybe at like an org like Open Philanthropy or something like that, seems like a, a promising a promising route for somebody to take. Yeah, do you worry that kind of uh, improving decision making stuff is just too indirect? Um, I mean, you could make that case. I think you can apply it relatively directly. If you, if you, if you had that view, suppose you had a view like, well, look, um, what I really care about is like AI and biosecurity preparedness. Um, you could just take you could just take the methodology and apply it to like uh, AI and biosecurity relevant forecasting, and um, you know I think I think that would be pretty valuable for the specific cause in question. Yeah, it's really annoying. No one's done that. I was going to just get like forecasting numbers. So if anyone's listening and wants to do that. Um, so all, all those paths are, are pretty competitive, uh, and the EA community is sometimes accused of being elitist. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think we are elitist, and, and if so, is it a mistake or, or not? Um. I mean, what is elitism? Maybe we need to define our terms first. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess that 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 would be that would be partly my question. Um, I think, uh, yeah. So, like, why why would someone make that critique? I think, like, you know, you might make. I I think if you see a bunch of if you see a bunch of people talking about charity and they have they're like talking about these uh, kind of out there ideas, very intellectual. Um, I think you know, I think we I think we uh, I think we used to be like. A little bit unnecessarily combative about like other approaches to doing good, mm. um, and uh, I think like you know that might be part of the cause of why somebody might look at what we're doing and say it's elitist. Um, ultimately, I think like those choices. 
I think those choices, as I see it, are driven, and also I think it's partly self-reinforcing. Mm. Um, so you know, you you have you have like a community that has like grown up to a, signif a significant degree in like Oxford and San Francisco mm. and Berkeley, and um, you know, so there's the people, the kind of like there's a bit of a founder effect, and we kind of cater to uh, the people who pay attention to us, um, and so you know, you end up with a lot of people who, um, who like have technical backgrounds, went to really good schools, and we're thinking about the problems that we can best solve. So, mm. um, and I think when I look at all the problems that we're, that we're most interested in, I think, you know, the, 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 the paths to impact often do look uh, research-driven, uh, egg-heady, technocratic. Um, and so, so I think, I think we shouldn't. I think we shouldn't. Um, we shouldn't like change our cause selection or views about like what is a good solution in response to what is ultimately a kind of social criticism about being elitist. But I do think. Um, is, do we have something to learn about like uh, about like how we're talking about what we're doing and like taking an attitude of humility towards that? I think. Uh, I think maybe. Yeah, there's one way that we could have uh, ended up. Well, we could end up focusing on these exclusive positions uh, mistakenly would be uh, if, if our question is like how can one person make the have the biggest impact and so we look for like very difficult roles where that person's incredibly influential and then we look at causes where one person can have a lot of impact um, but then as a result we can't really achieve very much scale because we can only there's only like a small fraction of people who are ever qualified to take those roles and if we'd said like what are roles that as a whole given the number of people who can end up, end up taking them would have the largest social impact then you might say well here's like a position where there's like a million different roles or something like well there's yeah. a million different um, there's a huge like room for more talent, basically. Yeah. Um, and whether each person is less less useful as a whole, they'll have a larger impact. Yeah, I think it's a legit question, and I think the your answer to that question might depend on your like cause selection to some degree. So, yeah. I mean, this interview and like this interview and like my personal priorities are like focused more heavily on like global catastrophic risks, and I think that those. I think it's harder to think of something that you know takes a much larger number of people and like as an input and helps a lot with like uh, the future of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, I do think, you know, I think, I think less about some of these other areas and I think it would be a, 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 in some ways a more interesting question um, that somebody else might be able to answer better. Like, well, if we, if we were doing something um, at huge scale with, with global poverty. If you had like a Teach for America of global poverty or something, meaning like, meaning like, you know, a thing that takes on huge numbers of like college graduates and places them in a role where they're doing something effective about the problem and has huge room for more talent. Like, that's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought it through. And like, maybe, um, maybe, like maybe there's something there. Similarly, like, you know, uh, could you do something sim with like with that in animal welfare? I don't know the answer, and I would sort of like you know defer to somebody who's like more involved in that space. Um, but I think uh, I think for like for AI and biosecurity, I, I think that like smaller community, technocratic, more kind of artisanal job spec mm -hmm. is uh, is like the place that it seems like the most it makes the most sense to be looking. Yeah. So one reason that you don't want uh, tons of people in the, those fields and it's quite artisanal is that there's a pretty high risk of people who are somewhat amateurish causing harm. It might I think be that, that's like, very true. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think that we're sufficiently worried about uh, people causing harm in their career? I mean, 80,000 hours perhaps, should we be advising more or fewer people to go into those fields? Um, I don't know, 80,000 hours like seems like roughly in the right place on that to me. Um, I do think, uh, I do think like, I think there's some subtlety to like um, projects we take on, like in the effective altruism community. I think um, there's a way you can evaluate your project that makes it perhaps a little too easy to make it seem like you're doing well, which would be like, well, this this is our staff, this is like our budget, this is uh, you know the number of people we helped, um, and say like, well, if we value our time at X and blah 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 blah, then like the return on investment is good. Hmm. Um, I think. Many things do take up like a slot in the sense that you know, um, well, there's probably only going to be one EA community organizer in this city, or one e e, maybe EA community organizer 
organizing group in the city. Or maybe there's only going to be one like EA career advisor group or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, we should be mindful of like, you know, who else might, might have been in that slot and what would their impact be. Um, and and that, that can be a way to sort of make it easier than it would seem to have negative impact by doing something that like seems pretty good. Because you can display something that would have been better that yeah. you never kind of sit and never perceive. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I think we've got another five, another five minutes or so. Um, I'm curious to know what you think about kind of the debate that was happening earlier this year around epistemic humility. Uh, you wrote this uh, quite popular post on Less Wrong, I think five years ago, where you staked out a pretty uh, well, strong view on epistemic humility in favor of uh, kind of taking the outside view and right. not, not taking your own like personal intuitions that seriously. Yeah. Um, it seems that there's been maybe a bit of, well, there's been some controversy about that, people pushing back, saying that that doesn't generalize very well. Uh, what do you reckon? Um, yeah, I mean, the motivation for that view is kind of like, if you take the sort of like, uh, in philosophy, they have this sort of like conciliatory views about peer disagreement where you're kind of like supposed to be like the average of people. Who, like if there's a disagreement, in some sense, your view should be like an impartial combination of the views of other people who take that view seriously or have thought about that. And maybe it's some weighting based on like how likely you are to be right versus them in disagreements of this kind. Um, that, that post was kind of like a macro it was kind of like the macro consequences of if you took that seriously, what would that imply? Um, and uh, another kind of framing that motivates it would be like, well, you know, you could think of yourself, we could think of all of us as like thermometers of truth in some sense. Like you like, you like throw questions at us and we get a, a belief about them and we don't totally know how good our thermometers are and I have one and you have one and everybody else has one. And we're like, which of these, how, how should, what should we do when these thermometers give us different answers? Um, and the view I defended was kind of like, yeah, you should be some impartial combination of like the output of what all what you think the other thermometers would have said about this question, um, where you're weighting by you know factors that you would think would indicate reliability. I think I basically still hold that, um, but uh, there was a secondary recommendation in that post that was like, you know why don't you test how well you're doing by you know, explaining your view to other people and seeing how much of it they buy. Um, and if you're, not, if you're only getting like, some weird niche of people to agree with you, then like, maybe you should think twice about whether, on, whether you're on the right track. Um, and uh, in some sense, I st think that's still like, a useful activity, but I think um, these cases where uh, you can only conv convince some weird niche of people that you're on the right track, but you're still right, um, are like more common than I used to think. Um, and I think partly some of the remarks I made earlier about like the structure of intellectual fields like is an input um, to my views about how that can happen. Um, so, so I guess, so I guess I, I, I've walked, I think I, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm walking back from that test being like very decisive about like how likely it is that you're on the right track. Um, and uh, and I, I, I also, you know, I don't know, there, there were some things that, um, you know, Eliezer Yudkowsky wrote a nice book uh, about this. And I think there's a part of that that I, that I really agree with, which is that um, you, you might not be able to know, it might, it might be very hard to tell who's being, who's being irrational. Um, some, somebody else might have some arguments that you can't really follow and they might in fact be right, even if, you know, you meet up and talk about whether that's the case and you're not, and like, you know, for all the world, it seems like one of them is more reasonable. So I don't think I have a lot of like super practical advice, um, but I do, I do feel like, um, I do feel like uh, it's possible to go too far in that direction. Um, another thought on that is just something about like, I think it may also be important for personal development to not be too overly modest about developing your own opinions about how things work. I think if you don't develop your own opinions about how things work and uh, see them tested and refined and figure out how much to trust yourself, um, then it becomes hard to do things that are like important and innovative and be one of the first ones to kind of arrive at an important insight. So um, I said something about that in that post, but I think I would, if I was, if I was writing it again today, I would, I would, uh, I would emphasize it more. Yeah. All right, my guest today has been Nick Bexted. Thanks for coming on the Fireside Chat, Nick. Thanks. Thanks.